And as they lead our children's ministry, and it is such a joy to have them in our worship services. You know, kids need to know what we do in here, amen? And they need to see it's fun, amen? amen. Okay, I just want to make sure y'all with me right there. All right, please open your copy of God's Word to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And while you're turning there, I um, want to remind you guys tonight that tonight we are continuing our study in the book of Nehemiah, and we're covering the entire chapter of uh, the third chapter of the book of Nehemiah tonight, but it is way too much to read from the pulpit, especially with all those names. <laughs> So your homework is to go home and read chapter 3 of Nehemiah, and then we'll come back tonight and we'll talk about it. Tonight, this morning, we're going to look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 40 through 51. And if you would, let us rise and stand at the reverence of the reading of God's holy word. 1 Samuel chapter 17, and we'll begin reading in verse 40. Talking about David. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he, was disdain, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag, and he took out a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled." Let us pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for your love, your grace, and your mercy. Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come and to open your holy word and to study. And Father, I pray that you would add a blessing to the reading of it this morning, that you would open up our minds and our hearts to the truths and the mysteries contained within it. And Father, show us that we as believers, that the battle has already been won. God, that all we need to do is trust in you. And so, Father, I also pray that if there is anyone under the sound of my voice that has never been born again, that has never been saved, oh, God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. Father, put a hedge of protection around this place, remove any evil spirit, anything that would hinder your word and your will from being accomplished. And we'll be careful to give you all the honor and all the glory because you so richly deserve it. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people say it. Amen. Amen. You may claim your seat. So this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject, Conquering Giants. As you know, for the next few Sundays, beginning last Sunday, we are doing a More Than Conqueror series, and we're just going to go throughout the Bible and look at different areas where the Lord was victorious in people's lives. Last week, we looked at Gideon. This morning, we're going to look at David. And our text today comes from one of the most familiar and one of the most recognizable accounts in all of Scripture. Israel was facing a formidable foe in the champion of the Philistines. The armies had gathered on the opposite sides of the Valley of Eli, approximately 15 miles uh, east or west of Bethlehem. For 40 days, get this, for 40 days, 
The Philistine champion, his name was Goliath, had taunted the Israelites to send a man down to fight with him. In fact, he said, listen, we don't have to fight at all, but if you just send one man to meet me in the middle and whoever is victorious, the other side will serve. Well, there wasn't a man who was brave enough to face Goliath. The losing side would surrender to serve the victor, and no one within the armies of Israel had the courage to fight with Goliath, none of them. Well, that all changed. That all changed when David was sent by his father to take provisions to his brothers who were among the garrison of the Israelites. Now, this story resonates with humanity because it is a story of both victory and courage. It is an underdog story, if you will. It reveals that the enemy can be absolutely defeated through the provision and through the power of God. And that's what we learn here. David, understand, was an unlikely candidate to face Goliath, and yet God brought a great victory. Now, understand this, my friends. We are no match for our enemy. Understand that. We are no match. But we are never, ever forced to face our enemy alone. Jesus was, has secured us. And we can overcome just like him. And like David, we too can overcome impossible odds and even enjoy victory through Christ our Lord. So let's take a few minutes and let's visit the intense moments recorded in this season of David's life as we consider conquering giants. Let's get into our text. The first thing that we see when David is facing Goliath is we see the difficulty. We see the difficulty. As you examine this particular chapter, difficulties immediately appear all over. And to fully grasp the enormity of the situation, uh, we must consider other verses as well that we didn't read at the beginning. And so we'll do that as well. And we can see in the difficulty, we see that there was apparent differences, (laughs) very apparent differences. I understand that this is the greatest mismatch of all time. The greatest mismatch of all time. No one, no one expected David to have a chance against Goliath. There were great differences. In fact, there was great difference in size. There was a great difference in size. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 4, the Bible says, And the champion, and that's talking about Goliath, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, I know most of us have no idea how big ten, six cubits and a span is. Well, it is nine feet, nine inches tall. David was corn fed. I mean, I'm sorry, Goliath was corn fed. You know, that, 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 that boy, that boy was a big boy. He was intimidating. You know, when you come across somebody like that, it will strike fear to somebody. In fact, if I saw Goliath coming down a dark alleyway, I would turn around or shoot one of them, because that is a big old guy. And, uh, and, so, and so this is the greatest mixed match of all time. Day, Goliath stood nine feet, nine inches tall. And David, it said this in 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 42, it said, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So while David, Goliath stood nine feet, nine inches tall, David was just a young man. He was young man, thin, and good looking. I don't know why he threw good looking in there. Maybe good looking is intimidating to some people. I don't know, you know. Uh, or, or probably, you know, you just don't usually see pretty boys as being the heroes, you know. I think that could be it, and God purposely did that. I don't know, you know. That's why I'm not a hero. That's bad, isn't it? I'm so sorry. That was a really bad joke. <laughs> I think, I think Misty would disagree with me. So, so Goliath was nine feet, nine inches tall. David was a small guy next to Goliath. I mean, he was. He was a small guy. He, he appeared as a child to Goliath. He appeared as a child. Not only do we see apparent differences in size, but we also see apparent differences in, in experience. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 33, the Bible says, And David and Saul said to David, You are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, you, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. 
You understand that David had no experience in battle whatsoever. He had no experience in battle, and Goliath had been fighting battles ever since he was a young man. Now, we don't know how old Goliath was, but he was no doubt an older man. You know, he was, he was, he was a grown man for sure, and we don't know how long he'd been fighting, but he was the champion of the Philistines. You know what that meant? He was their best. There was no one greater than Goliath. Not only do we see a different, apparent differences in size and experience, but we also see an apparent difference in weaponry. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 5 through 7, the Bible says that Goliath, he had a, he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his of his spear was like a beaver's wing, a beam, a beaver's wing. It was a weaver's beam. Four years, four years, and Misty lets me know of every single one of them. <laughs> like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed six hundred shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. So Goliath's armor, his armor alone, was 125 pounds, just his armor. The tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. I mean, it's almost like the size of a bowling ball on the end of a stick. It's heavy, you know. This giant of a man was well, well armed. But then, then look at, uh, then look at, at, at David. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 40, it says this. Then he took, talking about David, then he took a staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. David, opposed to Goliath, went into battle simply carrying a shepherd's staff, which is a big stick basically, his bag, which held five stones and a sling. That is like taking a water gun to a bazooka contest. Okay? It was hugely different. Okay? It was, it was, it was completely different. Now, from a human perspective, this would be no match in battle. There would be no match in battle whatsoever from a human perspective. And it appears that David stood absolutely no chance of defeating such a well-prepared and such a formidable foe. However, we will discover that David, well, he had a decided advantage. Hmm? He had the Lord on his side. We see his weaponry. Okay? And then not only do we see the apparent differences, but we also see the accusing doubt. Imagine that. The evil one's always trying to spread doubt amongst, his war, amongst God's warriors. We see the accusing doubt. In 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 28, the Bible says, Now Eliab, the, elder, the oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence for, uh, of your heart. You have come down to see the battle. You know, what, what, what this older brother was doing was accusing David of being arrogant, basically. Who, who do you think you are? You're just, a, you're just a kid. And by the way, who's back there watching the sheep? There's a, bat, there's a literal battle going on between the Philistine army and the Israelites, and their brothers are a little worried that the sheep back home are not being tended to, but that wasn't the case at all. You know what the case of it all was? David showed them up. David showed them up. For, for, for 40 days, his brothers have been out there, and not a one of them, not a one of them came up to face uh, Goliath. And here, here David comes. He goes, who is this Philistine? You know, he comes up, man, and he's just full of confidence, man, and he's full of, uh, of, of courage, and he comes upon them. And, and what I think, I, I think the brothers got a little bit jealous. Can I get a witness? You know, they got a little jealous, and, and so they began to sow seeds of doubt into the mind of David, but it didn't work. Even Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 33, King Saul, King Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. 
Understand that Goliath had come before the Israelite armies for 40 days in a row, challenging someone to send out uh, to fight him, and they all remained in their places, cowering in fear. Every single one of them, they were shown out. Man, they were called out by David. All of them were. And along comes this shepherd boy, young boy, with enough courage to fight the giant, and yet no one, no one believed his ability. They all assumed that David would die at the hands of the enemy. Now, stepping outside of it from a spiritual perspective and just looking at it from a human perspective, I would have thought the same thing, right? I would have thought the same thing, that here comes this kid, this kid that has no proper weapons, this kid that has no proper armor, who has no proper experience, is going against this nine-foot, nine-inch tall giant of a champion of the Philistine army. No, from a human perspective, David is lost from a human perspective. We see that accusing doubt. Understand that the world around us and the enemy that we face would have us to believe that we are destined for defeat. Listen, let me tell you something, Christian. The evil one has a certain way of whispering into our ears words that would cause us to doubt and to convince us that we are already defeated. And listen, I've heard that voice many times in my ear. Many times. Many times saying, you know, the devil will come into my ear, the evil one will come to my ear and say, Kevin, you just don't have what it takes. Kevin, who, who do you think you are? Who, do you, who are you? And, 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 and sow these seeds of doubt and saying you're just already defeated. Listen, I can't tell you how many times I've heard that in my mind and in my ear coming from the evil one. But understand, understand that when we serve a God of the universe, God goes before us in battle and we have nothing to fear. Nothing to fear whatsoever. The world assumes that we lack the ability to overcome and to experience victory, but I can't tell you how many victories I've experienced after becoming a born-again Christian. You know, it was, it was it, it, one of the first things that cleaned up for me was my mouth. You know, when I got saved, God cleaned up my mouth, man. He took, he took addictions away from me, man. And, and all the things that I could have never have, have accomplished victoriously in my life before I became a believer was absolutely solidified because of the cross at Calvary. That's an amazing... Man, we don't know what we have when we have Christianity. Wouldn't you agree? And so, there, uh, and so the world is always against us. But there's another thing that we see here is we see the certainty. We see the difficulty, but we also see the certainty. So as we continue to examine this miraculous account, and it is miraculous, we discover the certainty in David's life and the faith that he possessed. Consider, first of all, his confidence. Consider his confidence. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 36 and 37a, the Bible says, Your servant... He's talking about himself. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, I love that word, moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Do you know what David is doing? David is drawing on past experiences. David expressed his confidence in the Lord because the Lord has already delivered him from some things. Listen, he might have been just a kid and just a youth, but I don't know anybody in this room who has ever fought a lion and a bear and lived to tell the story. Can I get a witness? So, he, so he's drawn on past experiences. And, and David knew, I believe, well, he says so. David knew in his heart of heart that his past experiences, that his past victories came from the Lord Jesus Christ. And look, look when I look at my own life and see where God has brought me from the time I was saved on April 11th, 1989, I can look back and I can see all the areas in my past life where I was facing my own giants. And I was facing my own problems and my own circumstances. And every single time, let me tell you, church on the authority of God's word that God has come through victoriously every single time. There is no reason for me to fear that God will leave me now. As long as I'm obedient, living in the word of God, following the word of God and worshiping the word. Listen, let me tell you something. God will always go before me victorious. He has proven it. He's proven it time and time and time again. We have nothing to fear whatsoever. We see his confidence. David was, has assured him that God will provide. His confidence was not in his own ability. 
He believed that his confidence was in the Lord because that's what he said, right? He turned around and said those things. You know, fear often cripples the lives and hinders us from pursuing what God has called us to many, many times. But we can rest confidently in the power and the provision of Christ. Listen, as believers, you've heard me say time and time again that every believer, every born-again Christian has a calling in their life that God has placed on their life. Whatever that calling may be, Christian, you have a calling in your life. But I believe there are many Christians who are living in fear of that call because they don't know what's entailed in that call and they're afraid that they're going to embrace the call, that God is going to ask them to do something they don't want to do. Let me tell you something, God has never been that way. There is nothing to fear because if God is going to call you, God is going to equip you. Understand that every single time. There is nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear. Let me ask you, sweet Christian, what is holding you back from surrendering to the Lord Jesus Christ right now? What's holding you back? Is it fear? Hey, fear not, for God is with you. He will abide you and he will will give you all the things that you stand in need of. So we see his confidence. Not only do we see his confidence, but we see his commitment. We see his commitment. In 1 Samuel 17, verses 45 through 47, the Bible says, Then David said to the Philistine, (laughs) he didn't go through a mediator. He said to the Philistine. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all of this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Wow. Wow. I don't think the nine foot, nine inch stature was any kind of intimidation to David, do you think? No one should have expected less from David. But this reveals much about the character and the commitment of the Lord. Hmm? He had spoken boldly while surrounded by the armies of Israel. So as David uh, coming to the side of the armies of Israel, he was speaking boldly, safe within the garrison. But now... Now he stood before Goliath alone. There was no one with him. It would have been tempting to ponder the gravity of the situation. Because remember, the the deal was that if uh, Goliath told the Israelites, if you send one person out and if I'm defeated, we'll serve you. And if I defeat him, you'll have to serve us. And so no one had David's back. Now David is alone, even though he is not alone. Does that make sense? He had the entire Israeli army behind him, and yet he was absolutely alone in this situation. The gravity of the situation was incredible. In fact, I would have questioned, man, what have I gotten myself into? Hmm? Few would have stood there preparing to engage engage Goliath in battle. David, however, never wavered. His courage remained even when standing in the presence of the enemy. But listen to me, folks. The enemy that we face today is no match for our God whatsoever. No match for our God whatsoever. So we see his commitment. And so so many times we also need that same commitment that David possessed. I I, I believe that he was absolutely committed to the Lord. He was committed to the Lord because of the past victories that he has already experienced in his own life. And now he's going before the Lord absolutely committed to do what God wants him to do. And you know what? That that, that has proven to be true in, in, in the world that I have lived in, that when someone is absolutely prepared, when someone is absolutely committed, when someone is absolutely sold out, in their faith in God that no mountain can stand in their way. I've seen it. It's happened in my own life at times. It's the times that I doubt are the times that I struggle. We need the commitment that David possessed. It is easy to serve the Lord and stand boldly within the comforts of the sanctuary. It is easy to share our faith when we are surrounded by others of like faith. 
We find it easier to stand when we are not alone, and yet there are times that we do not have the luxury of others around us. There will be some battles that you will have to face alone. But you're not really alone. In fact, there's not enough people in the world, enough armies in the world, enough weaponry in the world that can even compete against you when you have God on your side. Nothing. It's always amazing to me. We too must be willing to remain committed to the Lord, even the face of great opposition. And listen, we are going to face some great opposition. Man, look, look, look what happened just this week, uh, you know, you know when, when the Supreme Court struck down Roe versus Wade, and you saw all the crazies out there starting to attack uh, pregnancy care centers and churches and all these things. They've gone off the rails. You understand that this is just the beginning, right? You understand that. The closer we get to the end times, the Bible says things will grow worse and worse. But we just experienced a great victory. I never thought in my life I'd see Roe versus Wade overturned. Never thought in my life, but yet God allowed it to happen. And I've given God all the glory for it. Hmm? We see his commitment. And then in verse 48, we see his courage. We see David's courage. In verse, verse 48, so it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet God that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Man, that's courage. David possessed courage that exceeded, I believe, human limitations. When faced with the enemy, David did not hesitate. He ran toward them. He ran into the battle, not from the battle. <laughs> In fact, he ran to Goliath, ready to engage him in absolute battle. His fear had been replaced with faith. I will admit that this is easy preaching, but hard to practice in daily life. I understand that. It's true. Far too often we allow our worries and our fears to dictate our existence. Why do we do that? Rather than standing courageously with the Lord, many times we run from our battles and we're seeking a place to hide. There is no reason for the believer to fear the enemy. No reason. Understand that the enemy is a defeated foe. That took place on Calvary. When Jesus said it is finished, boy, that meant a lot of things. And one of the things that finished was the evil one. Hmm? It finished him. He's a defeated foe. Listen, when, when, the, when, the, when the evil one starts whispering in your, in your ear, uh, fear and doubt and all those things, just turn around and remind him of his future. His defeat was forever settled as Christ atoned for our sin on the cross and rose in resurrection life. That's where we got our victory. We should not seek trouble, understand, but there is no reason to fear when the enemy comes against us, none whatsoever. We are not fighting to secure victory. Victory has already been secured for us. We don't have to fight to secure victory. It's, al it's already there just for the taking. Then we come to verses 49 through 51, and we see the victory. We saw the difficulty. We saw the certainty. Now we see the victory. These closing verses describe the great victory that David enjoyed over Goliath, and no one expected him to be victorious, none. But they hadn't figured God into the equation. Hmm. Notice, first of all, his dependence in verse 49. In verse 49, we see his dependence. The Bible says, then David put his hand in his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. Wow. This reveals the dependence that David placed upon the Lord. You see, he stood against a giant with nothing but a sling and a stone, fully expecting that God would provide for him. Fully. His weaponry was no match for, Dave, uh, for Goliath and his weaponry. 
And whereas David couldn't even fit into the armor that Saul tried to get him because he was so small, so he went out without armor, and here Goliath was, was full of armor. And David went out into the creek, and he found five smooth stones, but he only needed one. There's a sermon in there. Hmm? God proved faithful as David's stone hit the mark, defeating Goliath with only one stone in his back. One. We can pick this apart. There's a couple things that, that are pointed out to me. Number one, it wasn't David's hand that slew Goliath. It was God allowing that stone to hit Goliath. The victory was in God propelling that stone because of David's obedience. That's the difference. And I don't believe David at all took credit for that, for that stone. Think about it, man. Hey, and I don't know how far apart they were. And yeah, my idea of a sling is a slingshot. You know, I used to have one of those when I was kids, you know, and tortured my friends. This is a sling. Now, I don't know how they work. I've seen it done, but I don't know how they work. And, man, I, I can just almost imagine him winding up that, that sling. Man, he's getting a good wind up. Whew. And I believe he saw the mark the entire time. And he watched that stone, and as it went and it stuck, it, the Bible said it sunk into his forehead. <laughs> all that armor, all that mail that he was wearing, all those bronze shields and his helmet and his spear and all these things, God found the most vulnerable spot on his body, a very, a very thin bone called the skull right here. Boop! Now, Misty pointed something out last night that I hadn't considered. And she said, you know, if a normal person is hit with a stone or a bullet or anything like that, with that force, especially at the top of the head, Normally, they go backwards. Goliath didn't. He fell on his face. I have thought about that ever since Misty said that. I have thought about that. Was that God's way of putting him on his knees where the Bible says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord? Was that a picture of that? Sounds good to me too. It all proved that, that all of this had nothing to do with David, but yet it had everything to do with God. He fell on his face. Do you ever feel like you are facing a mighty giant of opposition? And all you have are a few stones in your bag? Well, so guess what? You're not alone. David's great encounter may have been the first such victory to be recorded, but certainly it would not be the last time that God would provide for those who depend upon him, including in 2022. Our giants, they look nothing like Goliath, but even so, our giants still strike the fear in our hearts as well, do they not? And like David, we have nothing to fear. In fact, in fact, our Lord is faithful to provide for every single believer, and we can depend on him for such a time as need. Now, I don't know what giant you're facing, but we all face giants. It seems like we're alone. You ever been there? You, you ever just, you, you're, you're, you're all the time fighting, you're all the time struggling against uh, uh, the giants in our lives, and you're thinking, God, uh, you know, am I the only one experiencing this? I've been there. And Lord, who am I going to tell? God, this seems like, this seems like something I'm going to have to face alone, and I don't, I don't know what to do. And there's been many times I've faced giants in my life. Maybe you're facing a giant too. What is your giant? Is it, a, is it, is it sin? Is it sin? Sometimes your giant is fear. Sometimes your giant is unfaithfulness. But there is nothing that will come upon your life as a believer that God has not secured the victory for. Nothing. We don't see it. Sometimes we don't experience it. But that's on us. 
Not only do we see his dependence upon the Lord, but we see his deliverance. We see his deliverance. Verse 50 says, So David prevailed over the Philistine with his sling and a stone, and he struck the Philistine and he killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. This affirms that David had not secured victory through his actions, but God had provided victory for him. That's what this means, okay? In his moment of greatest need, God provided deliverance. And you know what? I look back on all the situations in my life, and God has always provided deliverance for me. Now, there were many times I ignored it. There were many times I rejected it, right? And I, I would pay the consequences for doing that. But there's never been a time in my life where God has not secured deliverance for me if I would only put my trust and faith in him. This was not surprising to David. For David, it was exactly what he expected. I don't think David had any doubt. I don't. I don't think he had any doubt whatsoever when he faced Goliath. I think he fully expected that the Lord would provide. I remember hearing a story between two pastors. And one pastor had a church where people were getting saved and joining every week and so forth, you know. People were being touched. And the other pastor was seeing nothing in his congregation. And the, the pastor that was seeing victories in his church he says, well, do you expect the Lord to move? He says, I really don't. Well, if you don't expect him to move, how are you going to see him move? We have to expect it. We have to expect that when, when we give the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world, that God will provide the victory as he sees fit. We ought not to be concerned about the growing of the grass. You leave the growing to God. It is our job to plant. It's our job to plant. Remember what he told Goliath in moments prior, that the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands? Understand that we are no match for the enemy, but we don't have to be. The battles that we face are not ours to fight. Victory has already been won. Man, I, I've, I've, I've even been in situations in my, own, uh, in my own ministry in different churches that I've pastored where, where something big would come up, something big that, that needed to be dealt with. But I knew, I just knew that it was out of my hands, that this is something that the Lord was going to have to do. And I would just simply surrender it over to him. Lord, I can't, I can't, there's nothing I can do. And God, I am asking you, that you would intervene. He goes, of course I will. I've already supplied the victory. I just needed you to trust me. Sometimes we just need to trust him and whatever that situation is. And I can tell you, I wish I could go into details. I can't, but I can tell you in every one of those situations, God came through and won the victory and I didn't even have to move a finger. Many times. There will be times when we must act in obedience to the Lord, but he never expects us to fight our battles alone. You are not alone. We come to verse 51, and we see, lastly, we see the assurance. We see the dependence. We see the deliverance. And now we see the assurance. Verse 51 says, Therefore David ran, and he stood over the Philistine, took the Philistine's sword, and drew it out of, the, of its sheath, and he killed him, and he cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now, I've been trying to put myself in this situation. On opposite sides of the valley, two armies stood in disbelief. In my mind's eye, I think it was so quiet you could hear a pin drop. Stunned. To say that both armies were stunned would be an understatement. I believe it was so quiet. That both, none of them could believe that this could even be accomplished. It wasn't even a battle. Listen, Goliath never even got a shot off. He never did. He could have thrown that javelin. You know, he could have done all sorts of things. Man, he could have just come around with a, with a right hook. He didn't throw one shot. All the fear, all, all, all the reasons why the Israelite army could not defeat the Philistines and Goliath is because they had fear in their hearts and they did not trust the Lord. 
And in this situation, it was proven that you can trust the Lord. The giant had been defeated by a shepherd boy, and his head had been severed as proof. There could be no doubt that Goliath had been defeated and God had brought great victory for the nation of Israel and this stood as a lasting testimony to the faithfulness and the power of God. How do we know it's lasting? Because here we are in 2022 talking about it. For the believer, let's fast forward a few thousand years. The scene is much different and yet there are similarities. Jesus had been crucified on the cross. Those who opposed him thought that they had rid the world of this blasphemous troublemaker. His lifeless body was buried in a borrowed tomb, and a stone was rolled in place to seal the grave. Three days later, as Mary came to anoint the body of Jesus, she made a profound discovery. The stone was rolled away. And the Lord was no longer in the tomb. He had risen just as he said. And this too stands as an, internal, uh, an eternal testimony to the power and the faithfulness of the Lord. He already conquered every enemy that you and I could ever face. The enemy was crushed as Jesus fulfilled redemption's plan and he rose victoriously from the grave. Christian, what have we to fear? Jesus conquered death, which is the greatest of all enemies. Our Lord is alive and well. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding for our behalf. And the resources of heaven, get this, are at our disposal and they're unlimited. The resources of heaven are at our disposal, and it all comes through Christ, who is the champion of champions. We all face giants that might bring fear and dismay into our lives. It's true. I'm included in that. And you may be facing the giant of doubt today. Maybe you are facing the giant of uncertainty today because you don't know what's in store. Maybe you got some bad news or, or maybe a doctor gave a bad report and there's uncertainty. Maybe there's uncertainty because uh, your children and your life are being attacked by the evil one or maybe your parents are being attacked by the evil one and there's uncertainty. We look out into the world and we see uncertainty uh, with the world around us because our world is on fire. And you know what? We should shouldn't have certainty in this world. We should always have certainty in Christ. Maybe, maybe it is the giant of sin. Is there something, is there something in your life that you're having a hard time with, that you're struggling with, that, that not only are you struggling, see, struggling doesn't always mean defeat, but are you finding yourself defeated with certain sins in your life? Listen to me very carefully. Listen to me. There is not one giant sin in your life that God has not already slain at the cross of Calvary. It is up to you to receive the victory. You can't do it on your own. How many times have you tried to quit and you can't? How many times have you failed? You know why? Because the victory has nothing to do with you. It has to do with God. And God has proven over and over again that he can supply all of our needs. But if you've never been born again, this means nothing to you. Oh, we can, we can listen to the, uh, 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 the positive thinkers and the positive speakers and you know, tell you just, just to believe in yourself and to believe in this and believe in that. Let me tell you, the only belief that you need is in a holy God. Only a holy God can secure your future and your eternity. And if you have never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it is not by accident that you are hearing this message, whether you're in this building this morning or whether you're listening by way of internet. God wants to save every man, woman, boy, and girl. But it is not automatic. 
You must reach out and accept that free gift of salvation that comes from Christ alone. And have you done that? Have you come to a place where you repented of your sins and you embraced and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in your life, forgiving you of all your sins and securing your eternal security? What about you? Do you know that you know that you know that when you leave this world, you'll see Jesus? And if not, we're going to stand we're going to sing and we're going to give you an opportunity to be obedient. But listen, maybe you are a believer, but you're struggling with some giants in your life. You know what? The victory is yours to be had. Be obedient to him today. Come to the altar. Lay it on the altar. Whatever you're struggling with, lay it on the altar and God will fight your battle for you. What will you do with Jesus right now? Let's stand and let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity to do business with you. And Lord, I pray first and foremost that there's anyone under the sound of my voice that has never been saved, that has never been born again. Oh, Father, I pray that this morning would be the morning of salvation for them. And Father, I pray for every believer who may be struggling with some giant in their life. Maybe it's sin, maybe it's doubt, maybe it's whatever it is. God, you know the need. And Father, I pray that you, would, that you would increase their faith, that you would give them the strength that they stand in need of to, to rely on you and to have faith in you. Because we know that through Christ, all things are possible. Father, have your will in your way, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother John, lead us in a verse of song.